Roger and Sarah Batsimer visit the forgotten coast of Florida on the next episode of Painting and Travel. Sarah climbs the lighthouse on St. George Island, while Roger sets up his easel and paints one of the oyster houses from days gone by. Sarah and I are in East Point, Florida. This is the Gulf of Mexico out there. St. George Island is just offshore. And this small town is located in the panhandle of Florida. I'm going to paint this small scene here and I'm going to start out using charcoal to just block in some large shapes. And I'm going to use the edge of my charcoal. And by just using the edge of this charcoal, I can quickly establish my large areas and sometimes it's easier for me to do this with a, the broad side of a piece of charcoal than to draw lines. I'm going to use some lines too. But this will establish my composition very quickly and easily. And if, I, if it's not in the right position, I can quickly and easily move it. There, I'm just drawing in this big shape of the roof and the building. I'm not drawing the roof and the building separate, nor am I going to draw this land down here separate. I want this all as one big area. This will kind of establish my composition. I've got a palm tree right over here, and I have my horizon right back here. Some large trees in here. Now this is an area that is well known for oystering. If you've ever eaten oysters, they've most likely or very likely come from right here in this bay, Apalachicola Bay. We can hear some of the oyster boats going by early this morning. Okay, I've got my large shapes. Now here I can take the edge of my charcoal, define these some more. We have an old oyster boat here. Another one right back here. Now you can see this roof is a little low, but this charcoal, I can just wipe it off quite easily. I think right now the building itself is too much in the center of the canvas. So let me move it over to one side. We'll move it this way. There, see how easy that is to establish this composition with the broad side of the charcoal. I don't always use charcoal to start my paintings. If the painting is very simple, I often just start to draw my composition with a paintbrush. Now this palm tree, I, I position myself right here because the, the palm tree and this building sort of group themselves together as one unit. Now if I had this palm tree over here, then I would have this to look at and this to look at. And my eye would kind of bounce back and forth. So compositionally, it's better if I push this palm tree in to almost make it look as part of the building. It creates one or two large shapes in here rather than, than many, many shapes. Well, I think this is all the drawing I need to begin with. I'm going to put out my paints. And while I do that, this is a good time for Sarah and I to show you around this area of East Point and St. George Island. The coastline here in East Point has a very painterly look about it. And besides tourism, the main industry is seafood, oysters in particular. When you see a long flat boat like this one, you know it's for raking up oysters with a long handled tongue. It's hard work. Harvesting them and preparations for market aren't easy, but many of the locals have done it for generations and are accustomed to the routine. The oysters are grated to size and rinsed in the shell. Some are boxed up and chipped off to the oyster bars and restaurants as far as New York City, ending up in delicious oysters Rockefeller or oyster stew or oysters on the half shell with horseradish. 
They're also really good fried in a light crispy batter, my favorite. Others are laboriously removed from their shells with skilled dexterity and sold by the pint. Watch how quickly it can be done when you know how. These are expert hands that make it look simple. Occasionally, you'll find a tiny seed pearl, not big enough for jewelry, but still, it makes you feel like you've got good luck. It's happened to me several times, and I usually keep them in a little box to remind me of the trip. A huge mound of shells builds up behind the oyster house, and gulls and a few stray cats are happy with the leftovers. There are also shrimping boats that bring back large, tasty gulf shrimp that can be bought wholesale or retail. Buying fresh seafood off the boat at a local market is something we like to do, and today we bought a red snapper just around the corner from where Roger's painting. Later on in the day, we bought some smoked mullet, which was sold to me by a man in his 90s. Just as soon as you leave East Point and cross over the four mile long bridge, you'll be welcomed by the St. George Lighthouse in its new location. It was moved here from Little St. George Island and was lovingly reconstructed along with a brick keeper's house and museum. We took our little boat and visited it years ago when it was in a picturesque state of disrepair. Roger did several paintings of it. You can see how the sand washed away from the beach erosion and pounding surf and left the lighthouse leaning and destined to fall over, which it did. Fortunately, the people in the area valued it so much they raised enough money to relocate it, and we're glad because we like the new location. It's easy to get to, and you're allowed to climb the 92 stairs all the way to the top where you'll get a great view of the Gulf of Mexico, the seemingly endless beaches, and vacation lodging. You know, families are having fun and probably planning a cookout. There really are miles of unspoiled, fine, sandy beaches to walk and play on, plus lots of great shells to pick up and areas that dogs can enjoy. Across the main street from the lighthouse, I went shopping in one of the galleries, which sells locally made pottery, photographs, silks, jewelry, and offers workshops. I recognized a lot of the scenes in the paintings because painters seem to be attracted to many of the same motifs. We also love the boardwalk in the beautiful state park on the east end of St. George Island. This really is a fabulous place to come and paint. There are a lot of paint outs and things in this area. And right up and down this strip here are a lot of the oyster houses that we just saw. Well, for my paints today, I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, alizarin crimson, and I put out some yellow ochre and naphthol red. And the reason I put out the yellow ochre and naphthol red because I see the, the white side of this house is a very warm color now and the roof, I'll probably use some of these brighter reds. Other than that, basically what I have is the three primary colors, blue, yellow, and red. This scene just really captured my imagination. And it's, it's funny how I think artists possibly see things a little bit differently. Uh, maybe many people would just go by and see this as just an old, discarded, fallen down shack. But with an artist eye, we just, uh, I don't know, I just tend to see the, the beauty in it and uh, taking a man-made structure and then nature has had its way with it. And it's, it's changed it to its own form of beauty. And I really like that. I'm going to try and put in just large strokes of color. Here goes another one of the oystermen out for the day. They use these great long tongs to pick up the oysters. When we got here early this morning, the sky was an incredible shade of pink, but that quickly disappears just within minutes. I'm going to lay in my greens next down here in the building, and I think I'll put the light color building itself over these greens. And that seems counterintuitive in a way. You would think maybe the better way to do it would be to put in the walls first and then put the green over it. But, and it can be done either way. But I sort of like to work this opposite way. And that way I work with, with negative areas. We'll see how this works out. I sometimes believe that painting is 90% seeing and maybe 10% painting. It really has so much to do with with how we look at things and not nearly so much about what we do with the brush and the paints because if we can't see it 
in a certain way, in an artistic way, then we can't paint it. So I'm concentrating more on, on trying to see these colors and these shapes accurately. You see this idea about seeing things is so much about simplification. Things have to be looked at in a very simple way because if I were to look at the side of this building and see all those leaves, there'd be no way I could just attack it and, and, and paint that. There's just too much going on. So instead of looking at all those leaves, I look at the big shape and I capture that big shape first. And I think that has a lot to do with maybe what some, what some people call the essence of a painting. Uh, because the, the essence of this painting is, is made up of these big ideas. And I don't want to break it down into so many small ideas that I lose the essence or the idea of the whole painting. These trees in the background are of course in the distance, so there's some atmosphere between me and those distant trees. So I'm adding a, some white to this and I'll make these quite a bit lighter. And when I squint my eyes, I can really see that those trees are, are much lighter. And also there's a lot less detail in those trees in the distance. So here again, I'll simplify these trees. I'll start out by making this one big strip of trees and create a large shape right in there. Now I'll put in some water, ultramarine blue. It's very blue this morning. We have a very clear sky. I'm going to have to adjust these colors as I go. Well, let's put in the sky. And since it is such a brilliant blue sky this morning, I'm using primarily just the ultramarine blue and white. But while this is still wet, I'm going to flatten out this sky by just some vigorous brushwork back and forth. This has to be done within just a matter of a minute or so. If I wait any longer than that, this will just dry. And that seems to be a very big disadvantage to a lot of uh, people, especially starting out with acrylics as if these dry so fast. But a little bit of practice and uh, there's a lot of advantages. You'll be able to work with it. I'm going to keep spraying my paints, keep them wet. Some of the oystermen launched their boats right here. So there's sort of a oyster shell road down here. Just those three colors, red, yellow, and blue. I can pretty much mix whatever color I want. Now, when this is still wet, I'm going to spray this with a few drops of water. I'm gonna let those drops of water absorb the paint I just put on there. And with a larger brush, it's a three quarter inch brush, it's a dry brush, I'm going to drag this across right here. And it's gonna, as you can see, it just picked up those little droplets of water and left me some pebble looking roadbed. Now I'll add some of the green down here. I'll just scumble that into that grayish area. And I'm going to let that dry for a moment or two before I go back into it and work on it again. We have two boats back there. I think there's a few more boats, but I'm going to just put the two boats in. No one ever got in trouble for leaving something out in a painting. But I'll tell you, I often get in trouble by putting in too much. So there again, it's a matter of simplifying. So I'm going to just put in two boats one right over here, but I'm going to leave that one out. One of these boats is in shadow, and so that will be, I'll make that a nice cool blue. Okay, here's one boat right here that's in shadow. This boat in the foreground is catching the light more, so I'll mix the white, yellow ochre, and I'll mix it in this pot of gray that I use for the boat in the back. The back of the boat is, is lighter than the front. It's catching the light a little differently, but I'm going to make it all just one color to start with. If I concern myself with too many nuances, too many details to begin with, uh, I'll lose sight of, of what I'm trying to accomplish here. I'm going to put in a few more greens 
right here. I'm going to jump back to these trees again. These are in the distance, but not as far in the distance as these. So they're going to be more intense. As things go back in the distance, they lose their color and they lose their, their contrast. They lose their detail. These trees here will have slightly more detail. I can see I'll need to get some cadmium yellow light here shortly because these greens are so vivid. There's no way I can get the vivid green I want with using just the Indian yellow. The Indian yellow is a very warm yellow and I want a cool yellow up here for these bright greens. Now I'll put the, this light creamy color in the side of the building by mixing yellow ochre and white. And I'm not trying to duplicate exactly what's over there, but I'm just sort of going by instinct here as to what might make a nice pattern of lights and darks. And I think even though I don't see this side of the house here, I'm going to put the house in there just to help describe what it is. It's a nice thing about painting. It's I can move things around to suit myself. Can't always do that with a camera. Now, just because I'm using negative areas now, it doesn't mean I can't go back in and put the greens over these uh, light cream colors too. I'm gonna go back and forth and back and forth with this. I'm going to leave that for a moment. Jump to another area. We have some part of the tin roof up at the top that's folded over. It's sort of a cool purplish color. I think I'll get out some burnt sienna. I generally don't use this many colors on my palette, but I don't limit myself either. I just, I use whatever I want. I mean, <laughs> there's no set rules to any of this. It's just whatever works at the, at the time and really what I feel like doing. So I have some burnt sienna and I'll put some yellow and touch of the red in there and will brighten this roof. It was really beneficial to start with these dark colors underneath because these lighter colors that go over this will now, now show up and some of these dark colors can kind of glow through them. I just keep doing a layer after layer of these, these colors. Get the larger brush again and we'll work on the palm tree. This palm tree, I'm just taking the point of my brush. I'm not I'm not paint, painting it this way. I'm sort of holding it parallel to the board and I just flip this paint up. I'll just flip this paint right towards the edge to make this sort of a feathery edge indicating these palm fronds here. It's most important that I get the edge of this form looking like a palm tree. What I do in here is not nearly as important as what I do right on the edge here. Well, parts of this little shed are in shadow, so I'm taking some white, I'm mixing some, I'm mixing some burnt sienna with it, and uh, a touch of ultramarine blue to make a, a grayish color, cool gray color. I'll try and touch some shadows in here. I've mixed up some dark color with ultramarine blue, and well, really all three of my colors there just to make a dark area right underneath the shed because this shed is up on uh, blocks of some sort. We have a dark shadow right under this boat and we'll put a dark shadow right under this boat here. Oh, well, I've got that dark color out. I'll put that window in here. That window is kind of nice. Makes a nice descriptive shape, doesn't it? I'm going to take some blue and just with a thin wash, I'm going to wash some of the blue right over this tin roof and let that red shine through it. Often there's a, a reflection from the sky, even though it's a rusty tin roof. If I put some of this blue on there, it just gives an indication that there's still some, a little bit of life left to that. I'm gonna keep going over and over that until I get it right. Also, another reason I wanna put this blue in here, I just wanna tie everything in. I want to create as much harmony as I can within this painting. 
Well, for that reason, I could even put some touch of blue in here on that roof there. I usually save the detail for last, but I'm going to pick up my small pointed brush, take this dark color with burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. I'm going to get out my cadmium yellow light right now to make these brilliant greens. It's pretty hard to make the brilliant greens with the Indian yellow, but the cadmium yellow will give me this tense, cool green. I'm going to use a dry brush on that. That means I just don't have a lot of paint on the brush. And I'll just scumble this over the top, right in here. I'm going to vary these greens. I will put some Indian yellow in here because I don't want them all a cool green. I want some of these a warm green. And down here, I have this brilliant grass. Look at that, it's so, it's so bright. Oh, And these warm burnt sienna colors I have underneath here will just help this green glow. This combination of the warm underneath and the cool greens on top. Put a few of these light greens in the palm tree. I'll put the trunk of this palm tree right in here. I'll make this a warm color. Most of the trunks of these palm trees do tend to be very warm in color. And not, not really brown, but just warm color. And I'll take some Indian yellow touch a bit of Indian yellow on that just to show some light spots. And I'll mix a cool green and put a touch of, uh, to put a touch of yellow ochre in that. And we'll spray these trees back here and we'll try and give these trees a little more depth. What I'm trying to do is make some, make enough notes of color here and design. So when I get back to the studio, uh, I won't have nearly as much work to finish this up. I can really see the colors out here in the field so much more clearly than I can from a photograph. And that's why I love working outside despite its, its complications. There, I'll just show a tiny bit of a sliver of that beach. Maybe there's some sun shining way back in that beach so I can lighten that. I want to work a bit more on this roof. Naphthol red. Indian yellow. I don't really know what color to mix exactly. I just have to start playing with these colors to see what I can get. Now with this dry brush again, I'm dragging these colors over this, these panels of the roof. I want to vary each one of these panels slightly. This makes a nice combination of colors because I have the dark colors underneath here, then I put the reds on, then I put the blue over it. Now I'm putting this these warm orange tones here. Hopefully it makes that glow just a little bit better than having put one color on there. Sarah and I have really enjoyed being here at East Point and also in St. George Island. The oyster boats will be coming in shortly, so there'll be quite a bit of activity here. I've got what I want on this painting. I've got some photographs. Let's go back to the studio and finish it. Here we are back in the studio and I'm going to put a few finishing touches on this painting. I'm using this tablet to display the photographs we took out on the site. So I'm going to set that right over here so I can reference it. I have all the basic elements in this painting that I want. I've got my values, I've got my composition. Now what I need to do is add the details. Since we have a limited amount of time here, I'm going to skip through these fast, but I'll show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put in more details right in this area of the house because that's an important area. That's where a lot of the focus is going to be. Parts down here aren't quite as important, so I want to kind of subdue those and play those down and play this part up. I might put a little more atmosphere right back in here with these trees and a few other details, so I'll get started. Now I'm going to put some of the foliage in here. I don't want to put very much because I want to keep the big basic shapes don't want them to fall apart by putting in too much detail. Now it's time to work on these boats and get some sunlight on this side and a little bit of shadow up in here. I'm putting this on as a thin wash just so the lighter, warmer parts of this can show through. All this is blue right here because all these shadows are getting the, the light from the sky, which is, which is blue. Where the sunlight is hitting it, 
that will all be quite warm. I think I might be able to add a bit more detail back in these trees, change the color somewhat to reflect more atmosphere. So I'm going to make uh, more of a blue tone. Still have it green, but uh, put a little more blue in it. I'll spray this. Yeah, I'll just lighten that up slightly. Well, just about all that remains now is to tidy up this area around this road. So I'm going to add some more greens down here, maybe some highlights, shadows, some accents. And I'll mix another light tone of primarily white and Indian yellow. Touch of alizarin crimson. I'm going to just put a few patches of sunlight coming across this uh, path, this road down here that's made out of primarily oyster shells from all the oyster boats that gather oysters out in the bay. I want to be careful I don't get that too light because I don't want it to compete with this house up here. Well, a few more touches with the brush finish this painting as far as I can take it. I did add these posts here, a few more highlights, and I softened this area with the grass down here, sort of blended that all together. Sarah and I very much enjoyed our time in East Point and the surrounding towns of St. George Island, Apalachicola, and Carabelle. It's a nice place to visit with lots of subject matter. So now let's take one last final look at this small painting. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Batsimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.